Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Hey everyone, Kristen Walker here, and I want to talk a little bit about our guest today. He is Dr. Mark Benander. He's the program director and full-time faculty member of Bay Path University's graduate psychology programs in developmental psychology and clinical mental health counseling. He's done so much, I can't even begin to list it all, but we're going to talk about the work that he absolutely loves to do in the field of autism, as well as the work he's doing in regards to trauma. We bring on our other podcaster, Dr. Christina Hallett of the Be Awesome podcast, who also is a professor for Bay Path. And we have a lovely conversation about what it is to really be in this field of mental health and why it is so important and vital. So thank you so much for joining us and thanks to Bay Path for supporting our network. Mark, thank you so much for coming on Mental Health News Radio. You are very welcome. It's great to be here. And of course, we are also here with Dr. Christina Hallett. Christina, thank you for joining me. As always, you know I love to do this, Kristen. (laughs) I know you do. So I want to ask you something, Christina. How has it been doing all of these interviews with your colleagues? (laughs) You know, it's great because one of the things that happens is that I get to learn even more information about people that I already know and value. So that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mark, I am I really am intrigued. The things that you've done are so varied. Can you talk a little bit about the work that you do in the field of autism? I'd be happy to. I, I have had the good fortune to have worked with both students and colleagues who work in early intervention here in Massachusetts. Um, most states in the country do have an early intervention program, and Massachusetts is up in the top echelon of rated programs in the country. And so I've had the good fortune to be able to work with folks in that field. And about 12 years ago or so, um, a colleague of mine came to me and said, you know, we're we're really in need of licensed psychologists to help us with neurodevelopmental evaluations for children so that we can help the children access the specialty services for autism that are available here in Massachusetts. And so I did some additional study and I did a fellowship in that area and I started consulting and doing those evaluations for early intervention. And I've been doing it now for about 10, 10 years. And it's the most amazing thing, Kristen. It is, it is, I want to take all these kids home with me. They're all so amazing. So what I do is I meet with other specialists in the fields like of occupational therapy or physical therapy and licensed mental health counseling. And we sit and we talk with the parents and do a long questionnaire with the parents about the history of their their child's development. And then we sit and play on the floor for about two hours with each child. And we do a structured evaluation of all of the skills and symptoms related to autism. And if the child meets criteria for a diagnosis of autism, I'm the one that writes up that report and signs off on it. And in Massachusetts, the child has access to about 30 hours a week of free therapy for autism. Thank goodness. My gosh. That's so much more than many, many other states. It's among the top. It's among the top. And it's a, it's a really intriguing evaluation process. It's mostly watching how the child just acts in the world naturally. 
It, we, don't, we don't ask the child to do specific things like some other testing does. We just play with them, we interact, we assess the child's ability to be social, to use eye contact, to use gestures for communication, um, to stay and play with us or go off on their own, that sort of thing. And we're also assessing the other side of autism, which is the way ch children use their bodies, the way they become focused or hyper-focused on things. And by the end of the two hours of sitting and playing, we have so many observations that we can make a very well-informed diagnosis of whether or not there is autism present. Do those 30 hours a week, do those include services for the parents? It's family. So when mm -hmm. ABA or floor time services come in, and those are the two main forms of treatment for autism for under three, um, when the service providers come in, they do work directly with the child, but they ask that the parent be present. And especially in floor time services, they want the parents or the caretakers present right in the midst of the therapy. So they're teaching the parents and caretakers how to do the work that they're doing. That's so important, right? Then that's fantastic. That's really wonderful service. And ABA works a little bit differently when they do their trials, their discrete trials with the children to train, for example, increased comfort with eye contact or the ability to make a point and use a point to select an item that the child wants. When they're teaching these skills, it's one-on-one -on -one between the child and the provider. However, they will bring the parents or the caretakers in before those trainings and after and explain what they've been doing and show, show the parents you know, how this is working and how they can keep encouraging that behavior. That's what led you down the path of, of this of this part of your field, Mark? Well, I've done, Kristen, I've done so many things. I, <laughs> I, I've done so many things in my yeah. career. I was eight years in the emergency room and I loved that. Um, I was another five years doing high level disability evaluations um, for people all over the country, flying around and talking to neurologists and psychiatrists all over the country. And I've done so many amazing things that have just informed me so much and made me even fall in love with the field even more. And at some point along the way, I had a couple of students who worked in early intervention in my program when I taught at a former college. And they, they, were, they were the ones who came to me and said, you know, Professor Benander, we, we really need somebody who's excited about this to help us with these children to have access to specialty services. And, and as I said, they, they piqued my interest and, and helped me feel more motivated to do that particular uh, niche field. And, and I've been doing it ever since. It's been, as I said, over 10 years. I don't know how many hundreds of children I've seen here in the Springfield area, but we go out and we sit on the living room floor of these, these mm -hmm. families' homes and get to know these people and are immersed in their, their family lives. And it saves the family a trip to a kind of scary and sterile clinic somewhere and where children probably aren't going to behave the way they do it in their home environment. And so the setting is, is amazing. And um, it's just I'm really grateful for the chance to have been exposed to this field and to be able to be of use to these, these children. Mark, you brought this into your current uh, work program, right? You, and your current university. I did. Um, I want to say five years ago or so, um, I started working with some of the other folks in the state who, who work with the Department of Public Health um, and its DPH who controls the early intervention system and the specialty services here in Massachusetts. And I started to understand that at the college level, at the university level, you can include the certificate training for Department of Public Health that allows people to work in the field of early intervention. So if I want to work in early intervention, and I'm going to call it EI for short going forward, if I want to work in EI more than 19 hours per week, I need a certification from the Department of Public Health that I'm qualified to do that. And you can get that certification on the job, but it takes a long time and it's a relatively frustrating, drawn out process. And now you're waiting for your, your salary upgrade when you finally get the authorization. And it's, as I said, it's tedious and, and drawn out. Whereas if the students can get that training as part of their master's program, now they're graduating not only with the master's degree that leads, that's eligible for licensure, but they're also graduating with that DPH certification. So the day they step out the door of their diploma, they can start working in the field as a developmental specialist. And two years down the road, when they get their LMHC, their license, they get an automatic promotion to the LMHC status. So for us, 
for wanting to help students get into the field right away with no delays, no drawn out process for certification. We're providing a service for students who want to work with that population so that they can work on day one the minute they finish the program. Mm, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. Talk to us. I know, I know that you didn't um, dive into this, but you did do a certificate program regarding, F, um, regarding refugees. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and what your interest was there? Sure. Um, you know, Christina and I share an interest in, in helping people with trauma, and Christina can probably tell you more about our new trauma certificate program here at, here at Bay Path. Um, but in my own history, I worked with so many people in trauma situations or trauma survivors in the emergency room and in the outpatient work I did after that, that I developed a, a very strong interest. And there's a, there's a group of survivors that get very little attention internationally, and those are the refugees. And these are folks who have typically no resources, no money, no insurance, no, gosh, they're, they're fortunate if they even have housing, never mind anything else. And there are millions of folks all over the world who are, are you know, victims or running away from violence and oppression and famine and, and po- poverty. And um, it's those folks who may, may be one of the largest underserved populations in the world. And Mass General Hospital has a program where on an annual basis, they set up a two-week conference, and it's, it's often in Italy. Um, Orvieto is a common location for it, but it's been other places as well. And they, you can sign up and go, and they offer an introduction, a training, to understanding the depth of this problem, the scope of this problem, and what international institutions are gearing up to support that group of trauma survivors. And it's, you know, it's, it's everything ranging from the World Health Organization to, you know, universities and academic institutions all over the world who are participating. And it's a, it's a phenomenal effort to, to bring trauma services to those populations, often going to um, camps, settlement camps, where these folks are, are, are surviving and bringing services to them at that level. Um, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm not currently doing any of that in my day-to-day work. Um, but my, I have a long history of just kind of doing what I can to promote trauma assistance um, from a programmatic level. And it's one of the reasons that I asked Dr. Hellett to help put together the trauma certificate, um, which we've just started at, at Bay Path University. It's a, a 12 credit for class, four class program in which students have advanced training and understanding theories and models, the neurobiology of trauma, and advanced treatment techniques for working with people with a trauma history. And Christina, do, is this a good time, Kristen, for Christina to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to, good segue. I was just going to ask you to do that, Christina. <laughs> well, you know, the thing is, we're super excited about this. And I want to add that it comes at the same time that we're also making all of our courses available online. And so these two things are happening simultaneously, which means that this is now available, not just to the students coming in or students who are in the program, but we've also geared this in terms of advanced trauma treatment skills to be available as a four course certificate for people who may already be out in the community, may already have a degree and want to get some additional training and skill building in specific working with trauma across a variety of different models. So in everything that we do, and I think this is really under Mark's leadership, it's just phenomenal. Um, He has really developed all of our programs such that they serve many purposes at the same time. And this is a perfect example of that. So the person who might do this certificate doesn't even have to be local to Longmeadow, Massachusetts, right? Now, right. suddenly, this is something that's available across the United States. And I guess, theoretically, you would know, Mark, maybe even internationally, maybe we need to get all those international people in, too. Absolutely. Um, because that's what we need, right? We, we know how big, Kristen, you talk about this all the time, trauma is yep. a major issue, certainly in the U.S. and globally. We've, you've got on on Mental Health News Radio Network's many shows regarding trauma. And the yeah. one thing that I hear from practitioners wherever I go across the country and internationally is we need more training in trauma. So that's why we are super excited to be offering this. Yeah, it was interesting. I did a show with our mutual friend that you introduced me to, Christina, um, Amy O'Neill, and um, she does the podcast um, 
on our show about trauma. She's a survivor of the Boston Marathon bombing and um, uh, her show is called The Trauma Impact. And we were just talking about this uh, with one of the survivors of the Columbine shooting. And we were talking about how, you know, there's all this work in trauma and we're getting to a place now where it's becoming part of the mainstream discussion. It's part of the mainstream topics that are out there like narcissism is as well. Yes. And <laughs> finally, that topic is mainstream. But what I found interesting was we talked about, you know, people come in and say, well, I'm trauma informed. And what Amy and and I brought up were, well, now we, now we feel like we're at this next stage where when people walk in, it's, well, that's great that you're informed, but we need you to be trauma competent. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And just so you know, Amy came and did a wonderful presentation at Bay Path University this past October. Great. Talking about trauma and resilience, which I think speaks to very much Bay Path University's commitment to supporting and and really working to provide opportunities for trauma competency. Well, there aren't enough, I mean, in my estimation, but of course I'm steeped in this field, but we still do not have enough people working in the field of mental health. So that's what I love about what the two of you are doing. And of course, what Bay Path is doing and making this online is phenomenal. But I want my, I want to ask you, Mark, um, the last question that sometimes is the most important is, you know, what led you down the path of wanting to even be in the mental health field? That's a great question, Kristen. I, my my father was a Lutheran minister. Um, he just passed last last year, um, but he his love for people, and he was one of those sort of New Testament kinds of preachers where he was always trying to help people figure out you know how do we how do we love each other a little better how do we forgive each other a little better um, how do we create lives of service um, out of our lives yeah. rather than lives of greed and that, that sort of thing. And my mom was a special ed teacher. She's, she's still with us and she's amazing and just really helping d- disabled children at the elementary school level with their education and that sort of thing. So I had my two role models were, were pretty strong in the area of, help, of human service and helping folks. And I knew I didn't want to be a minister. I knew I didn't want to necessarily be a, a, you know, an elementary school teacher, that sort of thing. But I fell in love with psychology in a, some, a couple of courses I took at it in high school. And my, this may be more information than you want, but my sister's boyfriend's brother was a nurse at Bay State Medical Center. And he heard that I was interested in psychology. And he told me, Mark, if you want a job on the inpatient psych unit, you got to get a job in the hospital doing something so that you have first access to the internal job postings. So I took a job as mm-hmm. a messenger. I was a messenger at Bay State Medical Center for three months. And sure I enough, love it. a counselor one position opened up on the psych unit. I applied for it. I got it like within two days. It was like a amazing uh, a miracle for me. And, and I was hooked from there. And I had the good fortune to have three team leaders who spent so, many t- so much time with me uh, sort of debriefing and supervising and helped me understand what was going on with all these clients. And there were other folks on there that were great mentors and teachers and so I had five years there, graduated from there to the emergency room, and I worked with all these fantastic nurses and doctors and was learning much more about the interplay between mind and body and the interplay between medical events and medications and, and the, our emotional challenges. And, and that was just, the, it was such a great foundation all the way around. And then I started mixing in some teaching. And so the first half of my career was clinical work full-time with teaching on the side and The second half of my career has been teaching full-time with clinical work on the side. And I just, I'm a very fortunate man. And I know I had two great role models in my parents to get me started on my my interests. And now I have to tell you, Kristen, I have the best faculty working with me (laughs) on the planet. Dr. Helen Mm. is amazing. She's brilliant and exciting. She is. is (laughs) Hardworking. And I have other folks. Elizabeth uh, Beliveau is out in Western Mass working with us, and she's amazing. And I just, I am very, very fortunate. I have some of my former students who are now licensed and working in the field who are teaching with us. And 
So I that has to be amazing to watch. Yep. Or, I mean, I grew up around educators, so an academic. So you know, I would hear this at dinner table conversation. But you know, this field that I love too, to watch someone get it and to really understand, um, and to see your students shine and want to be in the field, and then they're out there doing practical application of what you helped teach them to do. That's such an amazing feeling. Yeah, Christina and I get to watch these folks just just grow and grow and then sh- go to internship and shine. And then before you know it, they're getting offered jobs. And it's like, great, you go. <laughs> yeah, go, go, go. We need more of you. You know, I, I want to um, close with this because I don't know if the two of you saw it. I finished watching a series. I was asked to watch it by a friend of mine who um, is also a um, clinical psychologist. And um, she said, you need to watch this show called Unbelievable. Uh, it's on Netflix. And it's a true story of a, it's a series, a limited series, and it's, it's a true story. Um, and it's, it's about um, uh, sexual harassment. It's also about um, sexual assault. And I won't go into the details of it, but at the end of the show, one of the principal characters, and remember, it's a true story, one of the principal characters that wasn't believed um, about her sexual assault goes to see, finally, she gets help from a psychologist and I was watching it and the whole you know I watched the whole thing and it was fascinating but my friend said I I want you to watch it just to see what it is if I could encapsulate what they filmed at the end of this series to show this is why we need more counselors in the world Um, she said that I would do that because it did that so I encourage you guys to watch it but you do have to watch the whole thing I think it's like six episodes but (laughs) At the end, it, I, I would even show it in a in a you know in a class with mm-hmm. um, you know. It just shows how this woman that plays the psychologist uses what she's learned from her personal experience, her education, and so on, in order to help someone that is so completely completely mm-hmm. traumatized open up and begin to have a happy experience in their life it just encapsulated in the most perfect perfect moment wow that sounds great you know i want to (laughs) actually say something here i'm really thinking about this and one of the reasons that i am so grateful to work with mark and at bay path university is because our program model and really across the university but i'll just speak specific to our program is really based on having clinical practitioners as the educators and i think that makes such a difference because everyone who's teaching is also working in the field knows what it's like you know comes very much not the academic piece comes in but has been a practitioner clinically first and foremost and that the example that you're giving is exactly what it is that we're trying to help our students understand is that there's unbelievable power and healing in someone working with a competent professional through therapy Absolutely. I know we're, we're thinking of closing here. I just, just sort of on a philosophical point to back up what you two have just been talking about. There's, there's something that happens when you sit with someone in a place that's quiet and safe and some trust has been built between the two people. There's something that happens where there's an unspoken message. And I, I, I steal a line from one of my favorite authors, Patricia McKillop. There's a, there's a line where she writes that there is nothing that cannot be looked upon. Mm. And so many of us go through our lives feeling, oh, I can't talk about this with him or her or them, or I have to keep this to myself. Right. But if, if the client feels like it's safe, it's quiet, they're trusted, they're respected, and there's this unwritten, unspoken message that there's nothing that cannot be looked upon, I think people start to talk about things that are important to them and that need healing. And healing happens because of that dynamic and we can come from all kinds of different models and perspectives. And I studied Carl Rogers and I studied this person. I, you know, people can debate about what clinical per- tool is most helpful. But in my opinion, the, the healing comes from the relationship that's built between those two providers and that notion that I can say anything here and be safe and get better. Absolutely. I mean, being the, the good, beautiful, long time um, uh, patient of the mental health services over the course of my lifetime, I can say that that's true from, um, from a patient perspective as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Well, thank you both so much for coming on, uh, Mark. I'm so glad you're doing what you do. Same with you, Christina. And I want to make sure everyone knows the website they can go to um, to find you. It's www.baypath.edu. And again, thank you both for coming on the show. That was Thanks, wonderful. Christine. Thank you. Appreciate being here. Good intentions. I heat up and act on my emotions. Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial. Sometimes in you I can fight it. Good boy.